she obviously had had a very unhappy life for, for a long time, and I think the relationship with John was one of the first times in her life where she really uh, felt at one with herself. Nobody ever loved me like she does. Yoko encouraged Lennon to experiment with avant-garde art. He publicly declared his love for Yoko by dedicating his first exhibition to her. And if somebody loved me like she do me, who she do me? Yes, she does. In the actual opening night, he had a huge amount of white balloons, uh, 365 balloons, and they went up very, very slowly up above the rooftops in Mayfair, uh, and John and Yoko looked up, and the whole crowd outside and the press, and it was very quiet, a very sort of low in everything as the balloons floated away. I'm in love for the first time. But back in the studio, John's obsession with Yoko was beginning to upset the other Beatles. Tensions amongst the band had been obvious for some time, and Yoko's musical suggestions didn't help. They felt tremendously intimidated by this, um, all of them, not just Paul or, or whatever. It was uh, all four of them, particularly Ringo, actually, really felt uh, that she had broken the magic, that the intimacy was gone, that the the four-way bonding that these guys had, because they'd been together for so long and gone through so much together, was just being completely intruded upon and ripped apart by Yoko's uh, suggestions and, and uh, comments. Everybody seemed to be paranoid, except for us two, who were in the glow of love. And everybody sort of was tense around us and, you know, what, what is she doing here at the session or why is she with him? And all this sort of madness is going on around us because we want to be together all the time. You know? People were really angry, very angry about it, and thought that Yoko was, you know, the devil incarnate. Whereas actually, she was just John's girlfriend, and it was all John's fault in the sense that he was the one who said she had to sit next to him on the piano stool. He was the one who insisted that she even came with him to the bathroom in Abbey Road. I mean, she could have said no, of course, but that, but she didn't. When I first got into the situation, I had no idea about anything. I didn't have any idea about it, about how people felt about the Beatles and, and what it meant to them and what it would mean for John to get together with me. And in fact, I was talked about like a, the, the, the biggest homebreaker in the world or something like that. But of course, they don't realize the other side of it, that John might have broken my home too. Tony, Kyoko, and I. Everybody talks about bad, bad, bad. Yoko married John in the spring of 1969. Using their private life to promote peace and love, she and John took to their bed in a Yoko-style happening. John and Yoko getting together at that point pretty much saved John's life because he was really uh, in grave danger of becoming an acid casualty, of really burning his brain out, just really frying himself. What happened when John and Yoko got together was that they got strung out on smack almost immediately, and this got him over his, uh, his LSD period. The couple set up their marital home in a mansion outside Ascot, Tittenhurst Park. By April 1970, the acrimony amongst the Beatles had reached ahead. The band broke up, and Yoko and John withdrew from the world rarely seeing anyone but each other. It was almost like the bed in in reverse, that they were staying in bed day after day, week after week. You know, the relationship, I think, had become rather smothering for them. It was getting almost too intense. Certainly, the, you know, there were some drugs involved as well at that time, which didn't help. They were living very much in a cocoon in their own world. I will make it jolly. Yes, yes, you know, we have to make it jolly. Why? And we can't all afford to be neurotic. Jolly, maybe we might stop the war. You By know. being jolly? Yes, yes, because the thing is, have you ever seen a person killing somebody with a smile on his face and being happy? No. Killer 
Girls are unhappy people. And they're violent because they're so unhappy and so damn serious. Mrs. Did, Lennon, we're did, boring did each other, so I'll go. Do you about that? I mean... Thank you. Goodbye. I was fiercely independent kind of person. I didn't like the idea of getting married to anybody. And if I were to be married, I like the idea that I'm the one who's the earner. Well, you know, control freak, you can say control freak, you know. But uh, basically, I just uh, didn't want any of it, really. To add to Yoko's anxieties, her daughter's father, Tony Cox, was beginning to wonder whether the Lennon's world was the right place for the eight-year-old Kyoko. When I was a kid with my mom and John, this is when they first got together. It was a drag. Everywhere you went, people were, you know, screaming. I remember as a kid having to lie down in the back of cars and having to, like, when I came out of my dance lessons, having to go out the back door with dumpster and the garbage in the alley was <laughs> stupid things like that, you know. In 1971, Tony took Kyoko into hiding. The Lennons tracked them down to Miyoko, where they were staying with the Beatles' former guru, the Maharishi. Yoko was determined to get her daughter back. Oh, well, we tried to kidnap her. <laughs> <laughs> Which was a totally wrong thing to do, of course. And she started screaming. The Lennons were taken to court for attempted abduction. A custody battle ensued. The judge asked Kyoko which of her parents she wanted to live with. She chose Tony. I was not mean to her or abusive to her. But ignoring might be considered abusive in a way, you know, of course. Or getting married to somebody else might, might be considered abusive. Within months, Tony and Kyoko disappeared again. Yoko began a new search, but she wouldn't see her daughter for 25 years. The thing is, I felt that Kyoko probably would find out later, or maybe then, that I was looking for her. And that should be a kind of, some kind of satisfaction to her that actually I cared. And I don't want to do anything to harm her or hurt her. I don't want to cause any panic. So not for some like somebody to come, you know, mm -hmm. bring out the child or something. We don't want any of that jazz. We'd mm -hmm. like to just somebody find where she is and then we'll do the rest. We did the Ouija board to try and find clues because nobody could find. I, find a trace of Tony and Kyoko. So Yoko tried other methods, spiritual ways, to try and get a clue of where they could possibly be. In her search for her daughter, Yoko discovered a new source of power. The occult became a vital part of her life for the next decade. It made people even more suspicious of her. John was fascinated by her. Most people, even those who couldn't stand her, were fascinated and mystified by her. And she could call upon a certain type of intuition, a certain kind of, I'm going to use the phrase, people always get uh, up, uptight about this stuff, but a certain kind of mystical knowledge, as if she was tapping into certain sources of information beyond the kind of stuff that we do. I didn't really know who she was, even though she told me her name. And I know it sounds crazy, but it's like uh, uh, when she said, John, I said to her something about, oh, I get a man in your life, I get initial J. And she said, oh, that's my husband, John. And she kept looking at me like I was a little nuts. Even when she said John Lennon, I had to think who she's talking about. But at the end, something happened, something triggered off in me. And I looked at her and I said, wait a minute, you know, I, I don't think your husband has a happy ending. 
And she said, what do you mean? And I'll never forget, and I could see like a man's chest and said, it's like he sleeps in blood. That's what I told her. <laughs>